us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. Oh, see what our Savior has done. Oh, see how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. be back going the following week. Uh, Also, youth camp is coming up May 30th through June 4th. It's going to be out at Latham Springs. Uh, If you have a child or uh, grandchild or great-grandchild that's interested in going uh, to youth camp with us this year, please make sure you get with Matt, uh, and he will get you all the details uh, for that. Uh, Also, if you are new with us, there's this little perforated thing right here on the back. 
It's called a Connect card. If you'll fill that out, drop it in the offering plate. It uh, gives us record of your attendance, and we'd love to sit and meet with you and uh, answer any questions you may have and just have a good conversation. Plus, on the back of it, you can list any prayer requests that you have, uh, and the staff and I, will, we will pray over those tomorrow during staff meeting and all week long. Uh, if they're confidential, please make sure you write on the fact that it is confidential, and you can either slide it to me uh, or Sarah, and we will take care of it from there. Let's go ahead and open up with a word of prayer and then uh, continue on with our worship. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for the day that you've blessed us with. We thank you for um, the opportunity to come together as brothers and sisters and just praise your name. God, we just pray for, for boldness uh, as we face our world. And uh, God, we just pray that you, you speak to us uh, through music and through word this morning. Be able to reach us where we are and uh, bring us nearer to you. God, we ask all this in your name. Amen. Let's stand and continue singing. We're going to sing, To God Be the Glory. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. Life and atonement for sin, and open the life gate that all may go in. Oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son.
loved every song we could ever see. Worthy of all the praise we could ever breathe. And worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. In Jesus, the name above every other name. In Jesus, the only one who could ever say. He's worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Will you bow with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the beauty of this day, the bright sunshine, the coolness of the weather. They all remind us, or should remind us, of how your light shines upon us, how you brought the Savior to the world, that all who believe in him would be saved. Lord, we just pray that you would be with each and every one who is here today. For those who have difficulties in life, be it illness or grief or sorrow, 
uh, whatever that situation may be, may they look upon the light of the world in Jesus Christ, knowing that there is hope in every situation. We ask that you'd use this offering today to spread that gospel message that Jesus Christ is alive and Jesus saves. We ask that you'd forgive us, Lord, where we have failed you and our shortcomings. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Please stand for the reading of God's word. Psalm 78, 1 through 7. My people, hear my instruction. Listen to the words from my mouth. I will declare wise sayings. I will speak mysteries from the past, things we have heard and known, and that our fathers have passed down to us. They will not hide them from their children, but will tell of future generations the praiseworthy acts of the Lord, his might and the wondrous works he has performed. He established a testimony in Jacob and set up a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children, so that a future generation yet to be born might know they were to rise and tell their children so that they might put their confidence in God and not forget God's works, but keep his commands. This is the word of God. You may be seated. You find me. When I'm hiding behind all my disguises, you see me. It takes you to keep me breathing. You are heart, passion, vision. You send me and bring me close, 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 so close until when you look at me, you see you. You are heavenly, my present and future destiny. You are father, creator, sustainer, life changer, pride breaker. You are the same yesterday, now, and forever. You are pleasure, worth, reason, present in every season. You are worship, devotion. You are the reason for all my commotion. You are the one that I pray to. 
you can tell that I'm nothing without you. So awesome that I can even pray to you, about you, to know you, to sense you, to believe you more, to love you more, to obey you more, to give you more of my heart. Oh God, search me, know me, see me, examine me, test me, watch me, investigate me, question me, be pleased with me, have me, change me, sustain me, decrease me, decrease me. So there is no me left, only you, only you, only you, our light, our true, our you, our hope, our joy, our strength, our escape, rescue, safe. You are peace, you are belief, you are advance and retreat of what, to what, to whom can I compare you? You are my all things new, you are my place of refuge, my fortress, my rest, my creativity in the strength of your words to me. You are my ability to see, hear, feel, move, live, breathe, be. You are life and death all at the same time. You are friend, believer, savior, redeemer. You are the truth. You transcend old age and youth. You are timeless priceless, lightness in darkness, greatness, goodness, sinless, and in a mess like my life, you see righteousness. In fact, you leave me speechless. You alone are God. Our God. Such simple yet powerful words. You alone are God. Words that give us hope. Words that give us encouragement. Words that give us a peace of mind. Words that provide comfort for us. Words that we should always remember. We should always repeat. You alone are God. Words that the early church both knew and understood. And they leaned into in good times and in times of trouble. As a matter of fact, we see in the book of Acts chapter 4 how when Peter and John got released and came back to the church, the church gathered together. They rallied praising God's name and saying, you alone are God and you can do all things. They didn't run and hide from the persecution that was knocking on the door. They decided to turn and face it, strengthened in the knowledge that the one true God was on their side, that God was all-powerful, he was all-knowing, he was the creator, the sustainer, and he would get them through. They had remembered what they were taught. They had remembered what they observed. And in turn, they're sharing it, they're praising it, they're lifting their voices together as a collective body, and those that are in observance are being taught. Those next generations are being taught. We always have somebody who's watching us, and it may not feel like it, it may not seem like it, we may not realize it, but we always have somebody who's watching us. They're watching our actions, they're watching our words. The question is, what are they observing? This morning, we're going to be spending our time together over in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy chapter 6, and as you turn there in your Bibles, what I want to do is I want to share just a little bit of context with you. This part of Scripture is known as what's called the Shema, um, and the Shema was basically a daily prayer. It was a confession of faith that essentially is equivalent to our Lord's Prayer that we recite today. The Israelites would recite this as part of their daily prayers to help remind them of who God was and to respond to him out of love and faithfulness and obedience, to respond to his grace and his mercy that has been poured out in their lives. The opening words of the Shema says, listen, Israel. Now, listen, Israel. We, we say, well, I'm listening, or I'm hearing God, or, or I'm listening to what he's telling me. But what, is, what these two words are emphasizing is not just hearing the words, but letting these particular words penetrate so deep into our innermost being that they're written on our hearts, that we, can, we know them without a doubt, <clears throat> that they generate a response, a calling to act, in faithful obedience in our relationship with God. 
to remember who God is and to act out of that remembrance. The Shema was such an important part of Scripture, such an important reminder of how we should react to the relationship that we have and what God's love has done for us that Jesus himself references it in a conversation with some of the Pharisees in the book of Matthew. Look with me at Matthew chapter 22. We're gonna put it on the screen here. It says, when the Pharisees heard <coughs> that he had silenced the Sadducees, they came together. And one of them, an expert in the law, asked a question to test him. Teacher, which command in the law is the greatest? He said to him, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. Here, what he's doing is he is referencing Deuteronomy chapter six that we're gonna be looking at this morning, referencing the Shema because of the importance of it, because of the reminder of it. Jesus is referencing this part in order to stress the fact that as believers, as Christians, we must first understand and realize that God is unique. He is set apart. He is almighty. He is the creator. He is the Alpha and Omega. He is strong. He is mighty, he is wise, he is good, and he is loving. He is loving. We need to ask ourselves, though, two important questions when we think about who God is, what he's done for us, and how we live in our relationship with him. Two important questions, and that is, has an affection for God truly taken root in my heart? Has an affection for God truly taken a root in my heart? And the second one is, am I passionate about the one, am I moved by the one who has laid down his life for me? These two questions, the answer to these two questions goes a long way to helping us understand what we're passionate about, where we spend our time, where we spend our focus, and what we're passing on to the next generation. The early church understood who God was. They understood what he had done for them, and they passed it on to generation after generation. And because of that, we are here today, praising his name. Let's read through Deuteronomy chapter six together. We're gonna start in verse four. Verse four, it says, listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Right there, there is no other God. God is the only one. He is the one true God. The way, the truth, and life, he is God. Sometimes we put other things as God-like in our lives but this is a quick reminder that there is nobody else. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These words that I'm giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your city gates when the Lord your God brings you into the land he swore to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he would give you a land with a large and beautiful cities that you did not build, houses full of every good thing that you did not fill them with, cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. And when you eat and are satisfied, be careful not to forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. There are two things that are being laid out in this passage that I want us to look at this morning when it comes to the church body, when it comes to us as a faith community. The first is as a faith community, as a local church body, there's a responsibility, there's a role that we fill that is to both complement and assist parents today in raising their children. We're to complement and to assist raising their children in learning God's commands. And the second is there's a foundation principle that is attached to our relationship with God. A foundation principle that goes deep and needs to be there in order for us to claim that we have this relationship. We have to understand that knowing God always involves experiencing a loving relationship with him. Knowing God always involves experiencing a loving relationship with him. Now, 
We say that and we go, well, sometimes I don't feel loved. Sometimes I, I feel like, you know, God's trying to humble me. Well, that's love. It's not always the love how we think of love in our language today. Think about when, you, when your kids do something wrong. It's out of correction that sometimes we have to show our love. And then it's out of joy that we love. But it always involves love. But how do we get to the point where we have this kind of a relationship? How do we get to a point where the first thing we need to realize is there's a big difference between saying that we love Jesus and actually living a life that's loving Jesus. There's a big difference between those two factors. And we need to understand that first and foremost. So how do we get to that? How do we get to a life where we are fully loving Jesus? It comes by spending time with him. It comes by spending time in his word. And we're not talking about just dry scripture memorization like many of us try to do. We're not talking about opening our Bible every once in a while whenever we feel like it to read through his word. We're not talking about coming to church whenever we feel like it. We're talking about spending time in his word. We're talking about being intentional about spending time every single day opening his word, spending the time reading through it, spending the time in conversation and prayer with God, coming together with our brothers and sisters and lifting up those voices in prayer, in praise. It's intentional, intentionality that builds the relationships. Think about how you make a good cup of tea. You take a cup of hot water and you set the tea bag in and let it be as long as it needs, right? Right? No, because it starts to get bitter after a while. But do you take it and you put it on the counter and put the tea bag next to it and just hope that it's gonna do? No. The first, the bitterness that comes is when we read it, but we don't apply it. It sits there, it just festers. And we go, well, God, why aren't you speaking to me? Well, I am, but you're not doing anything with it. The second is when we're not opening God's word in the first place. And we're just putting the water and the tea next to it. And saying, I hope that that will happen. That's what we do when we put God's word on the shelf. When we put the Bible on the shelf and we pass by it and go, hey, that's my Bible. I'm hoping that it'll dive in. I'm hoping it'll soak into me. You put the bag, the tea bag in the water and you let it sit there and steep until it transforms the water and then you pull it out. And then you have a good cup of hot tea. You know, our culture today, we lose this idea of steeping. We lose this idea of patience. We lose this idea of meditation. Because in our culture today, in our world today, we have been built to expect speed and efficiency. So much so that meditation, the quietness time with God, that listening to him speak into our hearts, that steeping in his word has gone by the wayside because we need it now. We pull up little Bible apps on our phones and we expect to hear what God is saying to us in the moment and we move on. We don't steep in his word. What kind of impact is that having on our lives? And what kind of an impact is it having on future generations? When we treat God's word in the back seat. When we put it on the back burner, all we're doing is sowing seeds of discontent in our lives and in our families. So getting to the point where we have a deep affection for God and our relationship starts by our hearts being filled with God's word, being transformed. And that's not something we can do on our own. But the prophet Ezekiel tells us over in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Our hearts are broken. Our hearts are sinful. Our hearts are flawed. They're full of rebellion. They're full of prideful arrogance. And God is gonna take that and transform it and give us love and humility. Give us a desire to grow closer to him, to become more like him in everything that we do. And it starts with first reading God's word. It starts with coming to a realization of who Jesus Christ is. 
it comes to, it starts with a realization of the fact that Christ came into the world, lived a perfect life, and took our place, taking on the wrath that we deserve and giving us his righteousness. He paid the price for us, the price we deserve because of our rebellion. Let's look at John chapter three, verse 16. It says, for God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For he did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. It's only after developing a loving relationship with God that we can then pass it down to the next generations. Think about when you're on an airplane and you have those little oxygen masks that fall from the ceiling. What's the first thing the flight attendant says? Strap it to yourself before assisting somebody else. Why? Because if you pass out, you're no, you're no use to them. So if I'm supposed to put it on myself before I can help somebody else, same thing applies here to God's word. It's gotta be inside me, otherwise it's not gonna come out. I have to be steeping in his word. I have to have a relationship with God. I have to understand the power of God in my own life, and I have to have a relationship with him in order for me to then teach somebody else. I can't do it otherwise. It's only after having that relationship that we can teach the next generations. And it has to start somewhere. It has to start with us taking the time. Now, we can totally have, from a worldly perspective, a happy family. We can have kids that grow up and say, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir. They can do everything right. And that's fantastic. We want our kids to succeed. We want them to be respectful. We want them to be good. We desire for our kids and our grandkids and our great-grandkids and on and on and on down the line for them to be happy in what they do for them to find something that they're good at, that they're successful at, that they can make a career out of, that they can be financially stable, that they're respectful to people, that they, that they live a good, upstanding life. We want that for our kids. But there's something more that we should be wanting for them, and that is a life with God. That is a life that is centered around God, a deep, burning affection for God. And how do they develop it? They develop it by watching us. They develop it by hearing how we love Jesus. They need to see in our lives that we have a deep affection for God. They need to hear it in the way we talk. They need to see it how we interact in our workplaces. They need to see it how we interact at the grocery store. They need to see it how we interact and how we deal with problems and struggles in our life. How do you handle frustration? How do you handle when you're upset? Who do you turn to? How, what comes out of your mouth? How do you treat people? How do you talk about people when they're not around? You're always being watched. Always. What are we teaching the next generation? They need to be seeing that God takes a precedent in all of those areas of our lives. The next generation needs to see and experience how to love Jesus with all of their heart, all of their soul, all their mind, all their strength. And there are three things that I feel we need to remember that will help us to live this out in our life. The first and foremost is God's word is all powerful. God's word is all powerful. Let's look back at Deuteronomy chapter six, starting in verse six. It says, these words that I'm giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your city gates. These words should be in every aspect of our life. Love God with everything that we are. Love him with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind. And teach the younger generations this. The word of God is powerful and it will change lives. 
if we would just get out of the way and let it. But sometimes we become so overwhelmed with what we have in our day-to-day world that we think, you know what, I don't have time to teach. I don't have time to share this with my kids or my grandkids or my great-grandkids. I don't have the time and I don't have the energy. I'm so busy, I just can't give it the attention it deserves. Are we really that busy? Are we really so strapped for time that we can't take a few minutes to teach our kids, to teach the next generations about God? Many people feel like they don't have the time because everybody in the family has something to do every single day of the, excuse me, day of the week, it seems. And it's hard enough to get everybody fed, showered, and in bed by 10 o'clock, let alone ourselves. But if we would just pay attention to the passage, we're already told how to have these conversations with our kids. We're already told where the time is. But we don't, we, we, we overlook it. And we say, you know what, I'm so busy, I'm so tired, I'm so drained, I don't have an extra five minutes. And besides, that's why they go to church in the first place. Listen, an hour or so at church, which is important, Hebrews 10, 25 tells us, do not neglect coming together. It is important to come together as the church body, but an hour or so a week at church does not compare to the 167 or more hours that they have at home. The place for primary discipleship is at home. The place for primary discipleship is in the family. Our role as the church body, our role as believers, our role as a community of faith is to complement and to assist the parents, not to take the place of. We can come up with all kinds of excuses of why we don't have the time, why we can't teach. But God already lays it out for us. Scripture says that we should be striving to have gospel-centered conversations with our loved ones at all points throughout the day. When we get up and we're fixing breakfast, don't have the TV on, don't have the radio on, have a conversation. Have a conversation with your children. When you're driving down the road to get to our many activities, turn off the radio, unplug the phones, turn off the video games, and have a conversation. Now, I know sometimes that it's hard because we're shoving chicken nuggets at them in the back seat, throwing those down the road as we're flying to the next activity. And we're all we're worried about is getting out of the way of the cars that are coming. But we need to have these conversations. We need to make it a point to have intentional family time around the dinner table. Now, sometimes that may only be one night a week, but that one night a week is important. That one night a week we should sit and say, hey, how's your day? What's going on in your life? And turn off all the distractions. There's an intentionality in what Moses is telling us here in this passage in Deuteronomy. There's an intentionality to be real, to be raw with ourselves and the next generation. We need to first look, do we love God with all of our heart, soul, and mind? Do we have an affection for him? And if we do, then our life should reflect it. And then we need to be teaching the next generations the same thing and helping them to grow in that. There are gonna be things that we're gonna feel ill-equipped to do, things that we're not gonna feel like we can quite measure up, but we just might surprise ourselves. It's important that our homes be a place of both theological and emotional conversations and a commitment to Christ Our churches are never gonna be strong without strong families. Everything in our culture today seems like it's fighting against having a strong strong family. But when our family units are shining out, coming through, when they're strong in their faith in God, when they're living out day to day, having those conversations and loving God with everything that they are, when those family units are that way, our churches are that way. When our churches are that way, our communities become that way. And the light gets shined into the darkness, and darkness flees. But it starts with the family. It starts at home. Number two, God is always faithful to his promises. He is always faithful to his promises. 
He's loyal. He's loving. He's faithful. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 10 says, When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he would give you. When we read through the Old Testament, one of the things that we see over and over again is that God is faithful to what he promises. He delivers every time. He made a covenant with Abraham to make a great nation and bless the world, and he did it. He promised that he would rescue his children out of Egypt, out of slavery, and he did it. He promised that he would deliver a Messiah for us to bring us into a relationship with him, and he did it. Every time God makes a promise to his children, he carries it out. The next time that you wonder, look back into God's word and remember that. His time frame, though, is different than ours. It's not the same. We can't understand how he works. Our minds are finite. His is infinite. But he always delivers. His faithful love all throughout the scripture is talked about by the biblical authors. We see time and time again how his love is not fickle, but is something that we can rely on, something that we can trust something that he sends to his children. As we read through the scriptures, we see in different ways how God has done this for uh, the Israelites. He's done this for David, but we tend to struggle in how he's doing it in our life. We start to think, well, okay, God delivered all these promises throughout all of scripture. Yeah, I can see it. I can look back and I can read it and I can understand it, but he's not doing it in my life today, or at least it doesn't feel like it. How do I know? How do I know that God loves me? How do I know that he's delivering his promises? How do I know that he's rescuing me? How do I know that he's pulling me out of my sin and out of my slavery? How do I know that I can trust him? How do I know that he cares about me? Look at the cross. Because Jesus is the embodiment of God's promises. You want to know? Look at the cross. Look at what Jesus did for us. This simple fact should be propelling us forward. This simple fact should help us to understand, you know, everything in this world, God is above all of that. This simple fact should be propelling us to carry out the great commission that Jesus gives us over in Matthew 28 where it says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded you. We need to, we have to model this for the next generations. We have to live this out in our life. This is what the early church did for us. They were facing persecution. It was knocking on the door, and they faced it head on, strengthened in the knowledge that God is all-powerful, that God is the sustainer, that God is the redeemer, that God's love overpowers, overshadows everything. They were strengthened in that knowledge and they faced it. And just like the early church faced persecution, we do today too. Number three, God gave us what we don't deserve. God gave us what we don't deserve. Look back at Deuteronomy chapter six, starting in verse 10 with me. It says, when the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he would give you a land with large and beautiful cities that you did not build, houses full of every good thing that you did not fill them with, cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. And when you eat and are satisfied, be careful not to forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, who brought you out of a place of slavery. When we read through scriptures, we're reminded that everything that we have is because of God. Everything that we are, everything that we have, everything that we experience is because of God and God's love for us. We have an abundance of blessings in our life and it is very easy to let that overshadow and cause us to actually forget that it's all because of God that we have it. We start to think, oh man, I did this. 
I accomplish this. There's a term that's used very often in our world today. He's a self-made man. No. God blesses us with opportunities to walk into. God gives us the opportunities. He rescued us from our sin. He pulled us out of our brokenness and restored us, bringing us back into a relationship with him, and he gives us blessing after blessing after blessing. We need to be intentional about remembering this and letting it flow out of us in two different ways, in our generosity and in our investment in other people. Just like the early church, they were facing persecution. We're facing persecution today. We're facing storms today in our world and in our lives. How are we gonna battle them? The storm that we're going through may be rough right now, but there's a light at the end of the tunnel. But there's another storm coming after that. And then there's another light, and then there's another storm, and then there's another light, and there's another storm. How are we gonna sustain by putting our hope and our trust in God? By leaning in on the fact that he is everything. By loving him with all of our heart, our soul, and our mind, and our strength. By loving God first. By listening to what he has to tell us. By understanding that he is faithful. And that he blesses us in so many ways. Now, these storms sometimes will get us down. And sometimes it's okay to voice a complaint. It's okay to say I'm struggling. It's okay to say I'm lost, I'm hurting. But we just should not dwell in it. We should let the relationship with God be the first and foremost. Foremost. We need to lean on our relationship with the Father and draw near to him. Then to realize the main blessings he give us that we don't deserve. And finally, we need to come together as a church to help build each other up, to lift our voices up, praising his name, in prayer for boldness, to face the world out there, to face the persecution that's knocking, to face the struggles that we have. We need to pray for boldness like the early church did. And while doing this, remember that there is another generation who is watching us. There's another generation that is learning from our mistakes. There's another generation that's learning from our failures. There's another generation that's learning from our successions. There's another generation that's learning from our loving, from our helping, from our serving. Yes. An important reminder of what he's done for us. An important reminder of how valuable we are to the one who gave us everything. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for loving us the way that you do and for giving us the opportunities to pour into each other. God, we know that you are all-powerful. We know that you can transform hearts and can transform lives. And we know that the way that more of your children are reached is because of the actions and the words of your children. God, you've called us on a mission to go out and to be your hands and feet to this world, to make disciples. God, help us to be able to step into that. Help us to lean in to our relationship with you first and foremost, to be able to spend that time intentionally with you in your word and in conversation with you through prayer and coming together with our brothers and our sisters and praising your name, lifting our voices high. God, help us to be aware of the fact that we're being watched, that there are people all the time around us watching and listening. Help us to be able to point them to you and not to this world. God, we ask all of this in your name. Amen. As we go into our final song, the altar is open. You are welcome to come down and pray. If you need somebody to pray with, to talk to, I'm here at the front. This is your time.
Oh, what, a, what an awesome Sunday it is to come together. Beautiful weather outside, great uh, fellowship with our brothers and our sisters. Speaking of our brothers and sisters, we've got a little bit of sad news. One of our brothers has decided he wants to move away. So, Patrick, come on up here, man. Patrick, if you haven't, uh, haven't known, has been back here on the drums for multiple years now. And uh, how many years has it been, man? Uh, about three, yeah. about three, sitting back there, keeping, uh, keeping the beat going, leading us through, and uh, they are moving to Ohio, mm-hmm. and so this uh, today is the last day that we get to experience him. Uh, we are definitely going to miss him, and we are so thankful for everything you've done for us, uh, so. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate it. I'm going to pray over, I'm going to pray over Patrick. Uh, if you can, just lift your arm out, and uh, we're going to pray together over him, and then I'm going to ask him to stand over here, and we can say thank you as, uh, as he leaves. Heavenly Father, we lift our brother up to you. We're so grateful for the many blessings, the many abilities and gifts that you've given him, and God, he is such a servant of yours. He, he, he gives of himself so tirelessly to lead in worship, to be there, to pray, to, to just pour into your children. And God, we, we just pray for safety for them as they embark on this new chapter of their life and uh, moving to Ohio and all that you've got planned for them. God, we, we pray for peace of mind and comfort uh, as they make this journey and uh, open opportunities for him to serve in the future. God, we ask all this in your name. Amen. Patrick, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all are dismissed.